So this video is an introduction to the finite element analysis solving process by taking a look at a one-dimensional problem, two springs in series with a force applied to one end and a constraint applied to the other end. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look. There's our problem here, the two springs in series with the force then, there's our nodes, there's our elements, and we know the stiffnesses for each of those elements. What we want to do is we want to be able to find the displacements at nodes two and three, the only two that are not fixed. We want to figure out the force through each of the springs and the reaction force at node one. And the solution process or finite elements analysis process is composed of the following six steps. The first is the elemental stiffness matrices. We, we go ahead and formulate those first. Once those are formulated, then we go ahead and use those to assemble the global stiffness matrix for the entire structure. And once that's formed, we apply constraints, which gives us our reduced stiffness matrix equation. And once that's known, then we go ahead and apply the nodal loads. In this case, it's just P at node three. And then we go ahead and solve for the unknown displacements. Once our unknown displacements are known, then we can go ahead and solve for the reactions using those now known displacements and we can also use them to solve for our elemental results in this case the forces going through each of those elements okay there's our structure here and we're going to go ahead and first look at our elemental stiffness matrices here's element one we say that we have the force in node one force in node two and our displacements at nodes one and two and there's our elemental stiffness matrix equation for element one. We have the same type of thing for element two, except it connects nodes two and three, and it has a stiffness, a slightly different stiffness, maybe. Maybe it's the same stiffness, and that's our stiffness matrix for element two. So there's our elemental stiffness matrix, matrices, pardon me, and then we use those to assemble the global stiffness matrix equation. Here we go. There's our first element. There's our second element, and now we go ahead and write in our global stiffness matrix equation which is composed of the horizontal displacement at each of those three nodes so it's a three by three matrix first we populate element one it connects degrees of freedom one and two which are also nodes one and two in this case so we go ahead and populate it there then we go ahead and populate in what's happening for element two note that there's an overlap here at node two, because both element one and element two connect to it, it's just fine. All we do is we just combine it. We just add it together wherever they overlap. And where there's empty spaces, we just go ahead and throw a zero in there. So that's how we go ahead and assemble the global stiffness matrix equation. All right, now we're gonna go ahead and apply the constraints to create our reduced matrix equation. That's our global stiffness matrix. We know that the displacement at node one must be zero due to that constraint that we have at node one. And so what we do is we remove the column and remove the row that corresponds to that constrained degree of freedom. And when we do that, then we create our reduced stiffness matrix equation. Everything that's left, okay? And the reason we can do that is, well, we can remove the column because anything times zero is zero, so it doesn't matter. We remove the row because that row contains the only unknown force. Well, of course, this problem is simple enough. We can guess what it is, but in general, it contains our unknown force. So that's why we remove the row and column. And when we do that, we get a reduced matrix equation. Once we have a reduced matrix equation, we can go ahead and apply our nodal loads. So there it is our original reduced matrix equation. We go ahead and create or recognize that our forces at nodes two and three is, well, there's nothing applied at node two, P applied at node three. We then can invert our reduced stiffness matrix, just like we have here, multiply it by our reduced force vector. And that gives us the results that we have for our displacement at node two and our displacement at node three. Now once our displacements are known, then we can use those displacements to solve for our reactions. And so we go back to the global stiffness matrix equation. There it is. We know that the displacement at node one is zero. We go ahead and plug in the values that we figured out 
for the displacements at nodes two and three. And when we go ahead and do that, we recognize that this that we solve for is really our global force vector. So that's all the forces, which includes our applied loads and also includes our reactions. And so if we want to solve for our reactions, well, all we do is we just take this global force vector that we have and we subtract our applied loads, which is just P applied at node three. And that's where we get uh, our reaction forces. Okay. So now we go to the next the final portion, which is solving for the elemental results, where we go to our elemental equations and we use our known displacements in those elemental equations. So here's our elemental stiffness matrix equations. We now know what our displacements are, so we can go ahead and plug those in. And we can solve for our elemental forces. But the main question is, which one is our elemental force? Well, we know by inspection that it's probably positive P because this is intention, right? But how do we know that? Let's go ahead and take a look at the finite element reason why that's true. So we're gonna go ahead and look at this in a little bit more detail, taking a look at element one here and drawing out our spring element for element one. We have a what's considered positive nodal force directions. In other words, you know, here's node one, here's node two. And when they're both going to the right, that's considered positive in terms of nodal forces on the element. That's what this vector is giving us, nodal forces. Now we also know that the element itself, pardon me, is considered positive or, or to experience a positive tensile force, well, when it's in tension. And so this is what's considered positive according to the element. So we look at the fact that the second node has the same direction for what is considered positive. The first node has opposite directions for what is considered positive. And so for that reason, we can go ahead and say that the force value given at the second node, this value that we have right here, also corresponds to the force in the element. All right. And of course, the same is true for element two. So that brings us to the reflection questions. One is, do the results for the displacement in node three match what you would expect using the equivalent spring approach? This is what you might use in the uh, physics, physics course, pardon me. How are the elemental stiffnesses incorporated into the global stiffness matrix? How do we know where to put those elemental stiffness matrix values in the global stiffness matrix. Why do the displacements need to be solved before we can solve for the reactions and the elemental results? And finally, what happens if you try to solve for the displacements without applying constraints to the global matrix equation? In other words, let's say you try to do it before you reduce the global stiffness matrix equation by applying the constraints. Those are the reflection questions, and that concludes this video.